Good evening, everyone. I am your host and instructor, Lainey Shaughnessy, and welcome to Spindle TV, your best source for CNC CAD CAM training videos. Spindle TV is brought to you by Digital Woodcarver, inspiring your creativity and providing you with the tools to create your own unique masterpieces. Welcome everyone. How are you doing this evening? I hope everyone's doing well. See a uh, few people popping in here. We're going to get started in just a little bit. Uh, talk about our project for tonight. Good evening, uh, Tom and Mike, Kevin, William Allen. Hey, Harry. Jeff, greetings, buddy. Hey, there's my honey. Hey, Sam. <laughs> All right. So tonight, uh, we while we're waiting for people to pop in, I'll just kind of give you a little bit of a rundown. We are uh, going to be talking about a uh, a spoil board uh, for a CNC now. The original design, of course, uh, when I created it, I made it for my CNC, which is the Digital Woodcarver 2440 model. And I, of course, I also have a variation for a smaller Digital Woodcarver unit called the Mini Carver, the 1824. But the waste port itself can be adapted to any CNC. And you'll see waste boards like this. Uh, you know, it's not anything new is by design or whatever. You'll see waste boards like this on units like the Axiom uh, CNC's. They have a, uh, a waste board similar to this, but it runs down the uh, length of their table versus across because of the way their uh, T-Track system and everything is. And so I wanna talk a little bit about this waste board, uh, the versatility of it, making it, and then the files that I'm gonna be uh, putting out there uh, and, and, and give you a little bit of an approach on how you would modify it to fit your CNC machine. Um, so uh, with that being said, with this particular waste board, uh, we can use mechanical clamps. You know, this is just a very simple wooden hold down clamp with a T-bolt. I've got uh, these other type of uh, edge clamps and everything that would clamp onto the edge. So that's another form of a mechanical clamp. We've got the um, fence stop and cam clamp. The pegs here fit into the holes of the waste board. Uh, and on the cam, it's off center. So that way when you turn it, it cam locks the part into place. So you have a fence, you would have your piece, and then you would have your cam that locks that piece up against the, you know, pushes it up against the fences and everything and all. And so these are, uh, these pegs and everything are carved right out of the material to, you know, fit right into the waste board. So we'll talk about that as well. Um, I also have uh, other fences and we're going to talk about other fences and stuff. This is a low profile fence that, that, that snaps into the holes on the waste board uh, for referencing material off of. Uh, and you'll see, you know, you'll notice that there's uh, some, a peg missing there and that's by design. Uh, we've got uh, you know, the opportunity for vacuum clamping. These are some vacuum pods uh, that would slide into the T-Tracks and hook to my vacuum pump for vacuum clamping. And then I have just a little uh, cam type clamp that has a lever. And you'll notice is that lever, uh, there's a slice here and everything. And so when this is on its side, pushing up against the material, as you cam, that pushes that end out, locking that piece into place and everything. So it's kind of like a little cam clamp and it's a little tight. You can hear that squealing and everything. Uh, you'll see these, this is nothing new as well. Uh, you'll see actual like bar clamps, F style clamps that are made, you know, uh, DIY style in people's shops and everything with these types of uh, uh, F style clamps and everything. And I've just taken and uh, 
I've got a place for a T-bolt and everything so it can go up against my material and can just lock it down with just a pull of the lever, you know, type of thing. So a lot of different, you know, uh, clamping styles and stuff. And I want to move over to the uh, main screen and you'll see the wasteboard laying out uh, with, uh, you know, some of the clamps uh, that I have. Uh, with it, and you'll see that there's actually a board in the uh, on the table with a couple of the fences in place, and then a couple of clamps. Now, because of the hole placement, sometimes the cam cannot reach to the board when you cam, and so there's some spacer blocks in there between the material and the cam and everything to uh, uh, fill up that that void, that space and stuff. But the versatility of this is whether it's running, uh, let's call it across uh, your table or down the length of your table, uh, it all depends on your T-track uh, formation or, or what have you. Let, let's say that, you know, like your uh, X-Carves and your Shapokos and all, they, they generally have an MDF bed already with kind of a grid on it, if I'm not mistaken, on the style. Uh, your axioms and sharks and all they have a metal kind of uh, T slot table T track table uh, digital wood carver has a high impact uh, table with integrated uh, aluminum T tracks now on the digital wood carver 2440 those T tracks run down the X axis down the length of the table RX axis and because they run along the length of the table these slats for the wasteboard are crossing over them, you know, running the width of the table. If those T-tracks were happened to run across the width, then my slats would run across the length of the table. And so we would have to change the design up a bit. And so based on your table uh, and your situation and everything, uh, you should be able to adapt this, uh, this, this table to, um, fit your needs to fit your machine and stuff. And the cool thing about it is, is it creates a, uh, the holes and the grid and everything. The grid is just for alignment. You know, it kind of gives you a square grid to your table. Uh, the holes give you different uh, clamping positions for the cams and fences and stuff. Uh, it's got integrated basically kind of T slots into it because each of the individual slats have a rabbit down the end of it or down the sides of it, creating a T slot effect. And, um, so it gives you a whole bunch of versatility with clamping. And then, of course, heck, if I just wanted to, you know, I could just screw, uh, you know, my board down to my wasteboard, right? If I wanted to put screw holes all through it and stuff. So, I mean, there's a lot of different things. I can use double-sided tape with it. I can use the tape and hot um, super glue method, you know, like the painter's tape and super glue. I could use hot glue if I wanted to. So it just kind of gives me a whole realm of versatility. Uh, and because my cams and everything are low profile, meaning if I'm carving in a three quarter inch board, uh, they're low profile, they sit below the surface. So I really don't need double sided tape or anything like that. I can just, you know, I've got an open surface to mill and surface and carve and all that stuff. Um, but if there was ever a need, like if I'm doing smaller parts and I don't want to put tabs in it or something uh, and I need double sided tape, I can do that. You know, I can double side tape it. I can hot glue it. Generally, double side tape, but you know, all kinds of things. Uh, in this picture, you'll see there's a couple of uh, on the back side, just sitting on the back side of it. You'll see a couple of uh, almost kind of wedge shaped pieces, and you'll see a fence here, uh, just kind of sitting on top of the table down here. Uh, this fence gives me the ability to slide this fence into the uh, T slots and lock it down and then the two wedge pieces depending on what size uh, I would need and everything I can actually put a wedge in between that fixed fence and my material uh, to create kind of a wedge clamp another form of side clamping and stuff and everything so it's uh, it's just it's pretty versatile it's pretty um, uh, useful waste board and I'm gonna go through a step-by-step -step on uh, making it so you can kind of get a general idea how you would need to lay it out for your needs and for your table. Uh, I'm going to go through making it and laying it out. And then we're going to go into the Vetric software where I have the designs, the files, the Vetric files that I'd be providing. Uh, and, you know, talk about how I set it up in the Vetric and then how I had to lay it out to run the actual carving to do all those holes that are two inches on center. They're three quarter inches in diameter. 
three eighths of an inch deep, two inches on center, uh, and then the grid lines and stuff. So we'll get into that. So uh, hello, Miss Debbie Miller and everything. How are you doing? All right. So let's get into the, uh, let's talk about the design itself are making the, the parts themselves. Uh, and let's uh, see if I can get that over here. Um, now you're not gonna see my uh, camera. Here, I could probably pop a camera on here. Hold on a second. Let me see if I can get my, uh, can I get my camera to pop up? I can. Hold on a minute. Let me see if I can get my camera to pop up. So in case I'm doing any hand gestures and you're like, what's he talking about? Uh, let's see if I can get this to work. It'll take just a second. There we go. Uh, you should be able to see me now at the bottom right corner of the screen. And, uh, oh, you might have been able to see me to begin with. Um, let me see if, uh, let me see if a second camera pops up. Alright, hold on a second. Oh, my camera was already there. Never mind, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I couldn't see my <laughs> camera, but you can. Okie dokie. All right. So basically, these slats, the individual slats, for me on my table, they're going to be running across, and that's my y-axis. The short side of my table is the y-axis. The length of the table is the x. And so my y-axis, my actual tabletop is 30 inches wide. So I rip down uh, from a piece of three-quarter inch MDF, uh, nine uh, 30 inch uh, long uh, pieces that were four and three quarter inches wide and I brought one of those pieces over to my table and I clamped it into position and I used a basically like a little T marking square and uh, I found the basically the at the center of each of the T tracks I made a mark and what this did for me was it allowed me to go ahead and lay out my layout lines. Now, crossing that mark, I went ahead at the center of this four and three quarter inch piece, two and three eighths, uh, I was able to make a, uh, another cross mark and that would be my X marks the spot center for drilling that hole for the, uh, you know, the, the bolt that's gonna secure uh, the part to the T-tracks. When, uh, after I've got everything marked and all, I was able to, uh, you know, make sure everything was nice and aligned. I used a simple pencil and an awl to kind of, uh, you know, make my initial uh, entry point and everything. And you can see my older, uh, in this picture at the top of the picture, you can see the older uh, wasteboard still in position and everything you know and it was basically I'm, I was, it was I'm just making a newer rendition of my older wasteboard but a little bit different style I'd like to be able to replace the entire just one slat at a time or a couple of slats rather than the entire wasteboard if I ever had to um, once I had everything laid out and marked this piece was going to then become my template uh, I was able to take my template and go over and drill some holes uh, on those center marks and then I could take all nine of my slat pieces and I was able to uh, clamp them, my template to them, to drill the initial pilot holes for that quarter inch uh, you know, bolt and everything. And so I did that with um, all nine pieces. I clamped the template, which I kept, and now I, my template is up on the shelf. If I ever have to make a new slat, it just takes just a few minutes to knock it out. But uh, so I was able to drill that. And then I had to decide about my countersink. So um, I'll, we'll talk about the countersink in just a second. 
Uh, but before I did the countersink and everything, I said, okay, let's go ahead and flip these boards over to the bottom side. Uh, and I took a T-bolt and I basically marked a T-bolt. Now, if you're getting a toilet flange hardware bolt from like Lowe's or Home Depot, those bolts have basically almost kind of an oval shape to them. A standard T-bolt for T-Track has flat edges. So sometimes if you get your T-bolts or your toilet flange bolts, whatever you want to call them, from Lowe's or something, you're ending up having to grind the sides so they fit into your T-slots on your table uh, and stuff. Well, Amazon sells uh, regular T-bolts, and these are quarter 20 T-bolts uh, designed for our, you know, uh, my size T-tracks, because T-tracks vary as well. And so I had one of those, and I made a mark, uh, basically kind of giving me an indication of where my rabbit needed to be cut on each of the parts. Um, from there, uh, I was able to uh, rabbit out each of the pieces on both sides you know on my table saw now here's the deal you can do the rabbits on a router table you can do the rabbits on your table saw heck you can even do the rabbits on your CNC if I were gonna do these parts on the CNC I would have to clamp them down securely and I would take a quarter inch end mill and I would have two lines that I would draw uh, you know in my Vetric software and I would do a profile cut down one line and back the other to create those rabbits. So there's a lot of different ways to create the rabbits for these and I chose to uh, use the table saw. Now the rabbits from my pencil marks I gave myself another sixteenth of an inch so basically from the edge of one piece I was three sixteenths inch wide and then a from the bottom a quarter inch up. Okay. So uh, basically my little rabbits were a quarter inch deep by three sixteenths of an inch wide. And that gave, uh, versa you know, uh, it was versatile enough that my T-bolts could fit in there, my square nuts and things like that. And when I go to turn to lock down a part, that T-bolt or that square nut is not going to spin, you know, in, in, in the, the rabbit because then it would be useless, right, in that T-slot if it was too wide then that's just going to spin around in circles and things and it'll be it would become useless the um, next thing I did is the countersink so I took a scrap piece of my MDF and I I did a countersink and I took it over to the uh, my table now my T tracks are shallow they're not real deep or anything so the hardware that I used was a one inch machine screw quarter 20 machine screw with a flat head and um, I my first countersink which is the one over here to the far right in the photo uh, the first countersink that I did was a little too deep so when I went to tighten the uh, screw down that machine screw down uh, it I bottomed out my screw hit the bottom of my T-track and uh, the part was still loose in there. I could literally spin it around the bolt. It wasn't, it was, it was just wasn't holding. So I went my second attempt and everything. Um, that was, uh, it was a little bit ideal, but I was still too close. When I tightened, if I wanted to crank down on that screw uh, and everything, because uh, I wanted to use one inch machine screws. As I mill the surface board down, you know, as it gets lower and lower, I'll end up going, I'll end up switching from one inch to three quarter over time or something, you know, but one inch was what I started with. And the second countersink was just a little bit, little bit too deep. And I was pretty darn close to bottoming it out on the bottom of my T-Track. So I then ultimately shallowed it up a little and I got that perfect depth. And then I was able to uh, go in and I used a drill press. Now you could use a, a countersink inside of a hand drill, and heck, you could put some uh, blue tape around that countersink to create like almost like a little visual depth stop. So when you get to a certain depth, you don't go any deeper type of thing. But I had nine of these boards. I had four holes and nine of these boards to drill, and I wanted the countersinks and everything to be exactly the same. So. I went through and I chucked up my countersink inside my drill press and I set my depth stop so that when I come down, it's going to be the same depth there each time. I could have, if I wanted to use my CNC, I could have clamped 
those nine boards down one at a time and I could have ran a countersink with my CNC, like a 90 degree bit in my CNC. I could have done that that way if I wanna use my CNC, if I don't have a drill press or a hand drill or things like that, I could have used the CNC for it. But I have a small little bench top drill press and uh, so it was uh, you know good for me to use that way. Once I got my countersink down, then you know um, I ended up putting all my hardware in and I used uh, one inch machine screws with square nuts uh, and everything uh, for the T-tracks and stuff. And so I, therefore, I, and that's a little bit better look at the square nuts and stuff in the machine screw. And from there, I was able to go ahead and slide that first piece into position. And I put that piece at the edge of the table. Uh, once I was at the edge of the table, I took my CNC and I put a, uh, I have a basically a quarter inch alignment pin uh, that I chucked up into the router and I went to the far uh, X positive side of the machine where it's sitting in this photo and I basically brought the uh, pin up to the edge of that part and I was able to secure one of the screws creating like a pivot point. From there, I took the CNC and I moved the Y axis to the negative side. And I was able then to uh, slide that uh, other end up to that pin and then secure it down completely. And this ensured that my slot that's gonna be created by these individual slats is running square with my table. Now to confirm that, once I got that part secured down completely, I was able to take just a regular carpenter square, uh, you know, just a regular square, and I laid it up against the edge of that board underneath inside the rabbit and against my T-track just to make sure that my T-track was square with my table and things like that, which it was. Uh, and, and I was able to just, it was a verification for me. Once that was done and that piece was locked into place, then I went ahead and slid all the other pieces onto the table, into the T-tracks, got them all into place and everything. Now, from there, I grabbed two of my regular T-bolts and uh, the only part that was secured right now was the front piece. That's my piece that I lined up and everything. The others are just kind of floating there. So I was able to take my two T-bolts and I was able to uh, take and put one on one side of the board, one end of the board, and one at the other end. And I set it on my table and I put it in between two slats. And then I was able to push those slats together, um, making sure that I wasn't too tight on the neck of that bolt, you know, that T-bolt. Uh, that I could slide that T-bolt from one side to the other and everything. And when I, when I was comfortable with the position and everything, I went ahead and secured that next slat down. And I repeated this for each slat after that. And once all of the slats were fully secured, then that gave me my T-slot spacing. Now, my cutting area on my CNC is 24 by 40 inches. Now, even though my waste boards run the full width of my table, which is 30 inches, I'm only gonna be working within a 24 inch area, you know, in the middle of this, you'll see in a minute. But I didn't put slats all the way to the other end of the table. Uh, my slats ended up stopping, you know, with that four and three quarters, you know, uh, it took me one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of the nine that I made. Uh, and that got me about 37 and like a quarter inches, you know, and my cutting area is 40 inches. So that means that when my router is doing a surfacing, my bit is going to be able to clear that whole surface of that waste board from start to finish and everything. And um, if uh, you guys and girls that do have the 2440s and are digital woodcarver customers, if you're uh, on your first slat here, uh, if your router does not extend over the end, mine does because of my joint maker jig and everything, but if yours doesn't, then your first slat is gonna be positioned inward on the table to where this router bit with your surfacing bit or whatever bit you use to surface can clear this edge because we wanna, we wanna be able to surface that entire waste board entirely. Okay, how you doing, Tim? Now, once I had all of my individual slats secured down, 
then I was able to uh, go ahead and uh, check out everything. I put my T bolts all in all of the slots and just made sure I could slide them back and forth with no hangups and I had plenty of room for movement and stuff. And what ended up being is, is my space, my gap between the two slats ended up being uh, around uh, like slightly less than a quarter of an inch. So my gaps were like a quarter of an inch wide. Uh, the, the neck or whatever you want to call the threads of the T-bolt were not quite a quarter inch. And so there was a little bit of play. So I didn't have a big wide gap up in this area here. But I had plenty of room that it was a nice, I wasn't forcing them, you know, they weren't rubbing real tight or anything at all. Now uh, that my T-slots worked all the way through, now I was able to come in and start preparing for surfacing. And this was a big thing for me uh, because what I did was my surfacing bit is an uh, inch and three-eighths, an inch and three-eighths in diameter. So that surfacing bit that you see there is an inch and three-eighths. And I took my router all the way to X minus, almost running into my limit, my limit. And when I got to my limit where it couldn't go anymore, I backed it off by about, like I would say, I, I backed it off probably maybe three-eighths of an inch from the limit. And I drew a line on the left side of that bit. Because imagine, if you will, imagine if you look at the mouse here, you should be able to see the mouse where I'm pointing and things. Uh, hopefully you can see the mouse where I'm pointing and stuff. Um, if not, let me see if I can create a marker here. So imagine if my board was clamped on the table you know, and I wanted to surface this entire board. I want this bit to be able to clear this, this right edge, right? I want to be able to clear it completely. And I know safely that my bit can go the full length past my board if I use this mark as the mark that I'm gonna, that's gonna be the inside of my planed area, my working area right so I never have to worry about uh, running into a limit or anything like that I'm kind of guaranteed that I'm I'm pretty good to go for at least that inch and three eighths let's uh, call it inch and three quarters because I do have a three eighths inch before I actually hit the limit hope that makes sense to you guys and girls um, so what I did was I made a mark on the left side of my bit uh, pretty much in line and let's go in and uh, let's see if I can clear that away and let me get back to my normal pointer Ooh, got a laser pointer there um, oh hold on a second ladies and gentlemen I need my pointer to trying to come on now get back to it all right oh hold on and unscrewed myself up <laughs> erase uh, all ink on the slide um, oh I was doing so good Okay, there we go. So then uh, that gave me my surfacing area. So that line, that pencil line that I drew is this line that you see here, this edge that you see here on uh, both sides. And I did the same thing on the other side. I took my one and three eighths and I brought it over here and uh, drew a line this time on the left side of the bit. And uh, that line is way crooked laney, there we go. But that gave me my edge. So this surfaced area here that you see in the center is my working area. I'm not really sacrificing a whole lot 
of working area. My router bit can't get to those sides anyway. This is my 24 inch and I ended up being about 22 and three quarters from left to right here. 22 and three quarters um, is my surface area of my 24 inch limit. And so I don't want to reach my limit anyway. So that 22 and three quarters is basically a safe zone for me. Okay. And so the now I could, uh, you know, uh, surface and my bit can run, you know, from one end to the other, clearing uh, the back edge, the front edge, and then the two sides completely. And when I surface, I don't know how you guys and girls surface your wasteboards and stuff, but when I surface my wasteboard, I basically, I'll take my bit and I will zero out in one part of my table, uh, you know, on my wasteboard, I'll zero out one part. And then I'll move over to the other three corners uh, and I'll bring it down to zero and I'll see if I have any low or high spots. And of those four corners, I'm going to find the lowest point of those four. And that's where I'm going to zero my machine out. And when I run my pocketing toolpath to surface that, my cut depth is zero. I am just literally bringing everything down to that low point. Now, if that doesn't work for you uh, because it has some variations of high and lows, then really you only need to be skimming off a 0 0.01, maybe 10 thousandths of an inch. But generally, if you find your low point of your wasteboard and you zero out there on that low point, when you run that pocketing toolpath with a zero cut depth, it's going to bring the rest of that wasteboard to that low point and level everything out to your CNC machine. And that's how I do my surfacing. I have a zero cut depth. And so I have a very fine line, uh, very fine. Not, there's not a whole lot of lip there, but it's definition enough from the two colors, from the dark tan of that original MBF surface to the milled surface and everything, that you have a nice defined line there. I, have, I, I, I can clearly see my working area visually and stuff. And so the... Uh, from there, I was able to uh, do some tests, you know, uh, take and clamp a board down uh, and stuff and all, but this was after drilling the holes. Now we're going to get into the hole drilling and stuff, and I want you to notice that uh, we have a row of two holes, two inches on center, for each slat. And then we have a grid line that gets run. So let's jump into the Vetrix software. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, get out of this and we're gonna come we'll come back to this slide to continue on but let me see what the other slides are here uh, let me see what they are uh, oh that was uh, talking about let's see here uh, just an overall review okay good so um, the overall review real quick well before we jump into the Vetric I have and um, I want you to let's see if I can switch back to my camera for a minute I have just a very simple piece of pine I have some walnut I have some different things and everything and um, this is probably about three-eighths of an inch thick uh, that piece of walnut here the, the actual fence here and this is probably a little over a quarter of an inch thick and everything and these can snap into my wasteboard all the way down the length of it and everything to create a fence for my project boards to reference against and everything. So I've got two of these uh, that you see that you'll see in uh, the picture here. And those are my two main fences. They'll never get moved. They, that, that creates my zero, X, Y, zero position, that 90 degree point, basically. And then I have my smaller fences that, you know, I can stick in various slats down the length and all. And then that gives me, uh, you know, basically a reference fence all the way down that X minus side of my table and stuff. Um, from there, I've got cams now and mechanical clamps and all that stuff that we can do. But now, uh, before we can put the fences in, we got to make the fences, right? We got to mill them out and make them. 
and we've got to mill the holes in the grid line. So now we're going to now we're going to get out of the um, uh, the PowerPoint. And we're going to go into the Vetric software. So let's do that. So uh, let's discard the annotations. Let's minimize this. And here I am in my Vetric software. All right. So and excuse that phone. Uh, it'll stop ringing here in just a second. That's not the office phone. All right, and so the uh, project, my project itself and everything, I have it set up for, I have it drew out for the width of my table, 30 inches. That's not the cutting area, right? But it's the width of the table, 30 inches, and that's uh, the y-axis for me. So that's that why I have that 30 inches here. And then the x-axis, uh, all of my slats added up together uh, totaled um, uh, 34 and 11 sixteenths uh, and everything. So uh, I that's what I put in there, you know. So from one end of the table to the end of my slats and all, it was 34 and 11 sixteenths and by three quarters of an inch. Now, in this case, I do have the job set up to touch off on the top of the material surface because it's my waste board, right? Because you're always used to me working off the waste board. But in this case, it is my waste board. So I'm working off the material surface, but I am starting from the bottom left corner. So that bottom left corner is my XY zero. Now, Laney, if this is your XY zero, but you only have a 24 inch cutting area and you've got the board the same size as your table, how's that gonna work? Well, let's walk through it and let's take a look. So first of all, let's go ahead and get my uh, individual slats on the board. Uh, so each of these rectangles uh, represents my individual slats. And then the gap between them, the gap between them is the gap that's on my table. I went and measured the gap. And if we look at a measurement, if I go in and turn on my dimensions, let's see, do I have a dimension in here? Uh, ignore those for a minute. Let me grab another dimension. I believe my gap was like 0.24 inches. So if I measure from here to here, it should be 0.24. And that was the gap, you know, on each of my parts after they were all secured down and everything. All right. So I've got my individual slats. Uh, and let's turn the dimensions off for a second here. And now each of the individual slats has a series of holes, okay? Now I've got two green lines, and let me get centered back up here. I've got two green lines on my table, uh, two lines on my table here and here. That's that milled area. That's what I surfaced the wasteboard. These lines represent that surfaced area that got surfaced and everything. Um, and the holes, all of the uh, pocket holes and everything, they are two inches on center. And you'll notice there's a hole missing there and there's a hole missing there. And by for my design, for my table, I have the joint maker jig. And where that space is, where that hole would have fallen, uh, I have brass inserts uh, that hold my, my joint making jig. So, I removed those holes from the design so nothing got milled there. Okay, they were uh, in, in irrelevant anyway. I didn't need them there. Um, I've got a little sample of a uh, little square, one of my square little fences drawn out here, which you'll see how that helps me in a moment. But from here, my holes, then, you know, I created my horizontal grid lines. And they basically run from the center of the first hole to the center of the back hole. And then I've got my vertical lines. And again, they run from the center of the top hole to the center of the bottom hole, those lines, and they're centered. So that when I have my grid, when that grid gets, I use a little 60 degree V bit and I cut a shallow 16th of an inch profile running along those lines, that profile cut that creates that grid, uh, let's see here, if we were to go into the 3D view and to uh, preview this, and let's get rid of that green color. I'm going to go with MDF here. 
We'll go with MDF. But I've got my vertical uh, lines that would, you know, run, well, let's not do that one. That was the holes. That wasn't the lines. Hold on a second. Laney. Um, I've got my vertical holes that, or vertical lines, that were just a very simple sixteenth of an inch deep uh, line. Now notice that my lines are off center from my table. You will see why in just a moment. Uh, from there, uh, I would have my horizontal grid lines and my horizontal grid lines would um, run, you know, along there creating that grid for me and stuff and all. So we've got our, you know, horizontal and vertical grid lines. Well, now, once I had everything laid out, it and you will too, because this is the file that you're going to get, and you're going to have to make sense of it all. Uh, you're going to have to make sense of how you're going to, um, you know, how I would recommend these are these these slats are four and three quarter inches wide. I would recommend working with a four and three quarter inch wide slat, no matter what table you have. And you know your table could use nine slats, six slats, five slats, whatever. However, you know whatever your cutting area is, but four and three quarters is a good size number. Uh, that gives us that gives us plenty of space to have two holes per slat, uh, and at two inches on center with with room around in between and stuff. It's good. It's a it would be a good thing to do. Um, so. If I, you know, turn off my horizontal lines and everything, uh, we've got these uh, slat holes now, and I'll ungroup them. Let's ungroup those. And um, so, if I ever needed to, if I ever needed to replace the slat, this is this this job right here. This file is my template file, basically. If I ever have to replace a slat. All I have to do is whatever slat it is, all I have to do is create the toolpath for the holes for that slat. You know, if uh, when I put that slat on the table, I put first thing I would do is put my surfacing bit in there. I would zero my surfacing bit out to any one of the other slats on my table, and I would run a surfacing toolpath, surfacing just that small area on that slat, bringing it down to the rest of my waste board. Then I could put in my quarter inch end mill and run my whole pattern. I can even put in my 60 degree V bit and run my grid line pattern and stuff and everything. You know, so I can do every individual slat and replace it as many times as I need. And once I make the tool pass for those individual slats, all I have to do is just run the tool path. I can run the surfacing toolpath because I'll have a surfacing toolpath for slat number two, a surfacing toolpath for slat number three, four, five, six, and seven, and one, you know. I'll have a whole pattern toolpath for slat one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and I'll have a grid line pattern for slat one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So once I have those files in a nice folder, I can replace any one of those slats that I need to. I can surface them all down. I can drill the holes and the grid lines and just, you know, like it like it was the same piece from when I originally started. If I ever have to, if I ever drill or cut or, you know, it gets beat up, I don't have to, you know, if I bury my bit for some reason into it and ruin the waste board, that slat or two slats, whatever, I don't have to replace the whole waste board. I only replace the one or two slats. And all. So now that I've got my holes laid out and everything, well, I can't, run the toolpath from here because zero zero is down here in the bottom left corner right and my router can't get to zero zero you know what i mean if i ran this job as it is if i calculated the toolpath with everything in the position that it's in now well i can't zero out this far over because that's the edge of my table this is the front of my table this is the side of my table my bit does not go that far right it only goes to this line here and everything so what I need to do is I need to bring all of this down to my zero zero to create my tool pass and you're gonna do the same thing so this is crucial this is the part that 
um, is going to be important uh, that you kind of comprehend. And if you don't comprehend, let me know and I'll do my try to do better explaining it. But we have to say, hey, we're zeroing out on the, you know, on our corner here. But I got the job set up like this. So what I have to do is I, I created a new layer that was called copy for carving. And basically that layer was my green lines here and here that you'll see now pink on the screen and all my holes and I just brought them down to the corner here. So let's turn that off and look at this green line. All I did was I grabbed all of this and I literally just moved it down and snapped it to the corner to create my position that I need to create my tool pass. Are you with me? The reason why I designed it like this is so that I could see the big picture. I'm a big picture kind of guy. I want to see, I even got, if you look closely, if I get rid of all the grid lines and everything, I even have the holes drawn in, the countersunk holes where the screws are. Those are all drawn into place and everything, you know, where they are on there. So that way, when I look at my pocket cuts, I want to make sure that none of my holes are interfering with my pockets, which they're not. They're not going to because those holes are centered and everything. You know what I mean? So I drew everything out so I could see the big overall picture of what my wasteboard is going to look like. And then once that was done, I was able to take my pocket vectors and my limits, basically this line and this line, I was able to select all of them and simply just move them down to zero, zero on my board so I could create my tool pass and everything. You know what I mean? Create my tool pass. Create my grid line tool pass, my, oops, not that one, my vertical line tool pass and all that stuff. Okay, all right. So do you understand that, how, why, you know, if I if I would have left those in the position they were, my router can't get over to that corner of my table, the center of that bit, so I had to move everything down to X, Y, zero for the purpose of creating the tool pass only. Nothing's changed, you know. My, um, it's still gonna run and everything on my table perfectly, but in the design software, I had to, you know, zero, zero is my, my, my start. Now, let's pop back over to uh, the PowerPoint for a quick second. And let's, uh, let me see if I can get, <clears throat> oops, oops, sorry you'll notice that the first hole, if you can see the mouse where I'm pointing, the first hole here is open because when I put my fence in here and here, when my board uh, comes in to, uh, sorry, where did it go? There it go. When my board and let's get let's get a board in there that's uh, doesn't have a. Do I have a picture of? No. When my board is in here, if I put that block that stop block in the first hole, well, my corner I wouldn't have I wouldn't be able to put a fence right here on this front edge, because my corner would really have no place to go. So by using the uh, first hole as kind of an opening, that gap between there where the corner of my board can fit and everything. Um, this little spot down here is my, you know, zero, zero position. You know, and I can, I can surface that and all. Um, and everything. So let's go back to the Vetric software. I'm all over the place. Let's minimize that. 
And so when I zero out, and let's get rid of this guy. Let me ungroup uh, this because that little block is going to confuse you. Before I do, let me do one thing to this block. Oops. Before I move this little block out of the way, let me do one thing to it. I can move that block out of the way. All right, so when I'm zeroed out on my machine, now my router will be able to come over and drill all of my holes. And again, we have a missing hole here and that's by design because I have brass inserts there and everything. So when I come in and create my tool path for my pocket cuts and everything, that bit's gonna come and let's do a preview and everything. Let's reset this preview. And let's see if I can pull, oops, pull this up. My router is going to start on the corner here and it's going to then come and mill each of those slats and I'd have it doing one slat at a time. So it's going back and forth on each individual slat right now. Okay. Once that was, and we can turn off the color. Once those holes uh, were all milled, I was able to, when it came back home and shut off, I was able to take my V-bit, put my V-bit in, touch off on my waste board, and I was able to run my horizontal lines. And then I was able to uh, run my vertical lines. And those ran together because they used the same V bit, so they were saved together. So I saved both of those tool paths together and everything. And so each of my individual slats now had a series of holes and the grid lines and everything. Um, and um, that was uh, pretty much it. But we had to move the vectors down to create that tool path. Now on the physical machine, I'm zeroed out on that edge. Uh, that's not a good picture. Hold on a second. Bear with me, I'm trying to find a good picture of my corner here. <clears throat> my bit is zeroed out, zero, zero is on this corner. And then it is, you know, coming over and cutting that first hole all the way down. Then it's coming back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, cutting those holes, you know, back and forth, each of the individual slats and everything, you know. So once the once all of the holes and all the grid lines were made, now you know that was a full run across the whole board. Now I would go through, and what you will end up going through to do is you will end up creating the files for the individual slats. So you'd create your you know your runs for each of your individual slats if you ever had to replace one. By a show of hands or by a yes and a no in the chat, are you with me and understand what I mean by creating individual tool paths to run if you ever had to replace a slat? And by a show of hands, are you with me up to this point and have I lost you? And a show of hands means yes, you're still with me, no, you're confused. 
And for those of you that just got in here and just jumped in the group, you're probably going to be a little bit confused because of the fact that uh, you're just now arriving. Um, and uh, the whole first part of this was discussing how everything was made. Uh, so Jerry Williams uh, has a question, and let's go ahead, and this is a perfect point to start answering some questions and everything. Uh, great. Good. Awesome. So you're with me up to this point. All right, I'm trying to make it as clear as possible. Now, you're going to get these files with the appropriate tool pass. Now, you won't have the T-Track holes uh, in the counter sinks because those are done by a hand drill unless you're going to do them on the table and it wouldn't be in this formation it'd be individual but um and so great to see all those yeses but let's go we got a question here um jerry says i may have missed it earlier but why do you want your spoil board outside the working area uh, and jerry is basically saying that um let me come back up here. Jerry's basically saying, if this is my working area that I have surface here, why do I want the spoil board outside of that surface area? And Jerry, here is the answer. If you notice on the table, the T-track positions if I were to cut my wasteboard off, just the working area, then that means I only have two bolts or two, you know, two points of securing these slats down. And depending on the humidity in my shop, the condition of my shop or whatever, I may have be prone, depending on, you know, how much space this is here, it's probably maybe like three or four inches. I may be prone to these edges here lifting up because there's nothing securing them. I would prefer that I run my wasteboard all the way the width of my table so I can use all four of my uh, T-tracks to secure this part down. And there's only like uh, three inches here, two and a half inches actually, and two and a half inches, um, that uh, you know I'm not gonna get any curling. It's gonna secure this board nice and flat all the way across. I would rather have four holes securing this wasteboard down than two. That would be the reason why I have it running across the full length of the table and not just in my cutting area. Okay. Uh, Jeff uh, says, in the last picture, with your router in the back and your touch probe was in place, it looks like the start point was the bottom right front of your CNC. Could you explain that? Yes. So what, um, uh, let's see if I can find a better picture here. <clears throat> so depending on your CNC, Jeff, and everything for the digital wood carver the operator's standing position is on the right side of the unit so right here between the wall and my unit is x minus or y minus sorry x minus is here at the front of the table y minus is here so the operator standing position is here so if that's my x minus y minus if we were to look at the vetric software imagine if this is me standing at my machine. My X minus Y minus is that my bottom left corner here, but in the picture it shows as the right corner, you know, in that picture. So I'm standing, imagine my wall, that white wall that you saw was here, right? My unit's there and imagine if I was standing in the operator's position, my X minus Y minus, my X, Y zero, basically is that front left corner here you know and so on the table when we look at the table that's that position over there where that touch block is that's zero zero x zero y zero over there okay my y minus is here my y positive is on this side 
x minus down here, x positive at the back of the machine here. And that's my x, y, zero, this front corner here. So hopefully that explained uh, that question. Now, Mark says, I'm not a little confused. I'm a lot confused, but that's because I don't understand the basics yet. Understand, Mark, that's, you know, it, it, it is. Um, uh, but um, if you were to make this table, Mark, and when you have everything clamped into position and you're at your, you know, your starting position and all, uh, where you zero out, you know, I, I know, um, let me get back to, let me find that picture. All right. I know that this, you know, once I have all my slats into place and everything, that this is my carving area, right? So my X zero is at the edge of the board here, the very first slat. My Y zero runs along this edge right here. Okay, so if I were to uh, draw a line, basically, and imagine that you know you're seeing the corner of my photo, but this is my Y minus, and it's also you know, uh, and this is my X minus, and so this is my X zero y zero position here and everything in that along that line along that line not the edge of my table because the router you can see that the router bit ain't getting over to that edge it's along this defined line that I made on the table that's my x y zero okay and all that was hard trying to write with that pointer okay um, so let's uh, let's see if I can erase all the ink. All right. And so when you're at your table, it'll it'll make sense to you, Mark. Uh, you know, kind of where you zero out, and you know you're going to be drilling your holes, running along here and stuff. It, it should. Um, and uh, Jerry, uh, glad, glad that, that that made sense to you. Uh, Mark, I'm glad you got it. Or uh, Jeff, I'm sorry, I'm glad you got it now. And uh, Debbie says, if my surfacing bit is smaller than yours, will it surface to the end as yours does? Well, Debbie, my CNC, my 2440, uh, I have the extensions on there that allow that 2440 to carve over the front of the table so that when I'm using the um, joint maker jig, bear with me a second. Bear with me a second. Oh, stand by, ladies and gentlemen. I'm getting click happy here. Let's end that. Click there, click there. When I'm using my joint maker jig, my gantry uh, has the extensions on it so that it can carve three inches past the front of the table. You can carve over the front of the table. So my bit. When it's run, when I, before I hit my X zero, my bit is three inches past the edge of the table. Yours, if you don't have the joint maker jig and all Debbie and everything, you don't have those extension, your router bit most likely will go right to this front edge here. So half of your bit will be able to clear past the edge of that table. So, um, Let's see if I can, half of your bit will be able to clear past the edge of the table to do the surfacing and everything. If not, then all of these slats get moved in a little bit. You won't have it right at the very end of the table like I do here. You know, you might have the this edge in maybe one inch from the end of the table. You know? Um, but you know, if you have a, 
let's say you're let's say you're not using a regular spoil board bit. Let's say you're using a half inch end mill. Um, you know, when you're at zero x zero, uh, that bit is centered on x zero. So half of the bit is already hanging over the edge. So you'll still be able to surface your entire edge. If for some reason you can't get to that edge with it being flush with the end of the table, slide everything inward an inch or so. Um, and uh, you know, now great question by Mike. Do you have to remove several pieces to replace one damaged piece? How do you get the square nuts uh, to line up? Uh, line up one one inch machine screw all right so uh mike is asking do i have to remove all of my slats just to replace one piece absolutely not all i have to do is unscrew the four screws and take them out my new piece already has the holes already drilled and countersunk in them so all i have to do is lay it down in there and then my square nuts haven't moved they're still in the same place. So all I have to do is put my screws in and screw them down because they will feed right into the nuts. The nuts haven't moved. If the nuts for some reason have moved, then I will take my awl, I will stick it down in that hole, and I will slide that square nut back into alignment with my hole. But no, I would absolutely not remove multiple pieces just to remove one. You unscrew the four screws and take it off, Put the new one on, put the four screws back in. If your square nuts slide a little bit in the T-track and they're not aligned with the holes, get it, you know, take the board and move it out of the way. Get the uh, screws, you know, the nuts, those square nuts into place somewhat. Put it back into place and stick it all in there and get them lined up and then put your screws in. If you don't know what an awl is, for some of uh, you that might not be familiar with that term, an awl is a straight pointed almost like an ice pick uh, if you will um, this is an awl and it's perfect for sticking down in that hole going right into the center of that nut and sliding that nut with the awl to line it up with the hole so everything lines up so it's like a little ice pick basically it's an awl a w l and um and everything so let's get uh let's get back to the vetric program let me escape out of this okay so let me delete uh my wall and me let's get rid of that and now let's talk about our um our fences and stuff and everything now on the waste board this first hole is never going to be used this first hole here and let me ungroup this uh, this first hole here is never going to be used it's still milled in there but it's never going to be used because imagine if i had um this here right and uh let's control c control v copy and paste and let me rotate this 90 degrees and slide this here right there you know that hole I can't put two fences in one place right so we, we wouldn't do that um, you know so basically the fence needs to go you know here and here so that's why I've drawn up this is my short guy, so he's gonna be there. But I also have my other fences. Let's move this one out of the way. And let me get rid of some of these vectors. Uh, let's delete this, delete this, delete this, and delete that. And so I have a fence with uh, two holes um, that I can, you know, place anywhere on my slats, no matter, you know, where I want to put them. I, you know, I can set fences up anywhere I want on my wasteboard and stuff. But for my two main fences, and let's get rid of this one. My two main fences, I have basically, it's almost like a double, right? 
And notice there's a gap missing here where there's no hole. I don't need a peg there if there's no hole. So that when I put this fence into place, you know, it's going to span those four holes there, right? And I don't want to do that. Remember I said this first one's not going to get used, so I want to back this up to here. So it's going to span those. I can put it anywhere. And the same thing with this one. This one's going to go here. And notice how that these holes don't line up, right? Notice how if I put this fence, oops, I moved my vertical lines. Let me do, let me change that. Let me turn off these vertical lines or let me delete them actually. Give me just one second. Okay. All right. So on this fence here, I need a fence that can span from this hole and these two holes. So if I ungroup this, this fence is not going to have a hole there. That's this one. Let me let me shut off my uh, let me change over to my camera for a minute. That's this fence here. You can see. So this fence down here is that fence. And let's go back to uh, the screen. And with, uh, if this one is drawn, it should be the right width if I uh, laid it out. This is an old one, but let's find out here. If I come in and snap that into place, See, it doesn't line up with those other two holes. It's too long, right? So I got to redraw this one. So I'm going to redraw it. Oops, don't do that. Let's delete this. Let's take one of my regular ones. We're going to get my center snapped in there. Let me do this the smart way, ladies and gentlemen. Bear with me a second. Where's my line? Okay. All right, so this fence here, now I need to draw this fits in and I'm going to trim And now I can take my three circles and this outside piece, group them together, and I've created the fence that's going to go there. It's going to be able to span. So now this fence, no matter where I put it, I'm able to span my from one slat to the next. You know what I mean? So let's get this centered back up. So now I have my fence laid out. I'm able to span from one slat to the next. I can get into that far right hole, no matter which, you know, slat that I'm in. What I, you know, if I wanted to, but I only made one of those. I've only made one of these, and it goes here. And then my little guy, my little guy. I have three of those that. Um, you know, that I have running down on each of the individual slats. Oops, that one didn't snap. Let's try that again. Yep, 
and you don't need I don't need fences all the way down but if we were to look at this in a realistic photo um, bear with me a second I have my two main fences and then I have my smaller individual ones spread out to create that fence that, that straight edge all the way across and everything um, so I only made one uh, double and one that has three holes in it and that's my two they never they never move from that corner of the table that's my fixed XY zero position so uh, my little guys, they move anywhere I want to put them on the table for whatever job I'm doing or, or whatever the case may be. They're just, they're, they're floaters. They can float anywhere and stuff. So to get back to this and let's, uh, let me get rid of. that let's move this one off the board now let's talk about this guy here this guy here is basically two of the small ones put together with a space in the middle and when I originally designed it when I originally designed it I had this into the first hole right uh, but again that first hole is not being used so only this hole here and these two. There's no hole in the middle. So what I ended up doing was basically imagine if I took this and I moved this down one, right? And I have this void here that that's why when I see if I can move this off. That's why there's no void there. You know, I have this void here, you know, over this hole, and I was like, wait a minute. When I, if I'm using that first, or if I'm not using the first one, then I need this fence has to be, you know, here. Well, this is where my brass insert is, so I need to move it over to here. So if I ungroup this, and I take my little nub and move it down. Then I could take my piece group that together and that's what gave me that fence you know so now I can come in and snap this into place and it's going to plug into four of the holes with a void right there where my brass insert is because there's no hole there, right? So I wouldn't put a peg on it. And these pegs, we have. You, when you get your files, you're going to get, let's open up a second V-carve. You're going to get not only the jig base, But you're also, here's the new fence stops file. Okay. The new fence stops file for running and, and cutting and pocketing those. You know, however, whatever size board you want to make them out of. But, you know, this is the new fence stop uh, uh, cuts. And then you're also going to get the cams and stops I'm not sure what that one is I believe it's the smaller guy yep there's the two files there and then I'll even include the original cams and stops for the round cams and the small two inch you know stops and everything so you're gonna get three separate vetric files one is gonna be the base jig that is you know um, that's the entire, uh, you know, design and layout and all that stuff. Um, and then you're going to get, 
I don't know why I'm turning those on. I'm an idiot. Uh, you're going to also get the uh, fences and blocks and everything. But I needed to explain to you how we would go about making this table, uh, whether, and, and for those of you that don't have the 2440, you're gonna have all the holes laid out, all the lines, you're gonna have, you know, the things. You're gonna have to change the size of the material. You're gonna have to change your placement and everything uh, and, and lay it out for your table. Your boards might not run vertically or horizontally across the table because your T-tracks run horizontally across the table. If they do, then your slats are gonna run lengthwise you know uh, our t tracks run lengthwise so our waste boards would run across the width and everything uh, a, a classic example of this um, if I were to open up a Google and one of our uh, competitors is the axiom CNC, and I think I misspelled that wrong. I did axiom CNC, and if we take a uh, close look at their images, images, images. We'll use this as an example. Their bed, right? Uh, let this pop up. Come on now, pop up. Oh, come on. Stand by, stand by. Where was the close-up? Right here. Load up. All right. So in their table, what they've done is they have quite a few T-slots running down the width of the table already. So they used one of the T-slots for their wasteboard, left one open. Used the next one for their wasteboard, left one open. Use the next one for their waste board, left one open all the way down, right? So that's how they would they set up their waste board with the individual slat system and everything because they have all the extra uh, T slots on the table to use. The Digital Wood Carver 2440 only has four T slots uh, on the table, so we the waste board itself becomes the T tracks and everything. So your table, depending on your CNC machine, your table is going to vary. Okay? Your table is going to vary. And so if we get back in here. Now, let's, let me open up another Vetric. And I'll get to your questions here in just two seconds, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, but if I open up the file for the Mini Carver, our DWC1824 Mini Carver users, they're going to only have four slats on their table. I, the 2440 has nine or seven, sorry. The Mini Carver's 18 by 24 cutting area, they're only going to have four individual slats on their table. The Mini Carver only has... The Mini Carver only has three T-slots running down the length of the table. One at two and a half inches from the edge, one at 12 inches, which is the center, and the other at 21 and a half inches down the other edge. And so they have only three holes securing theirs down and everything. Um, so they have a file that, uh, you know, they will be 
uh, using oops not that they have a file that they will be using for making their wasteboard but they're only going to have four slats your table depending on your cutting area and your CNC machine you would have to you know change it up to fit your table and needs and stuff and everything so let's get into some questions here uh, and let's uh, let's see here John Burton says you could also use the long fence in holes to align the wasteboard you could also use the long fence in the holes to align the wasteboard yeah uh, you're talking about uh, the you know to align the uh, spacing and stuff and things like that you could um, Debbie says, could you use two fence pieces like you just made to align the slats instead of T-bolts? That's what John was saying. So what basically the questions they're asking is, is let me turn this off here. And let me uh, come back into here. So what they're saying is, is, hey, on the two long fences, you know, uh, especially this one, right? Could I use that to align the spacing of each of the individual slats? You know, if I have this made already, could I do that? Yeah, you could. Then that would kind of guarantee the spacing, but you have to understand something. When, when this design was drawn, let's turn this up and turn all this off. When this design was drawn, it started with the slats right so the layout of the slats you know these individual slats here um, you know it started with those individual slats and the gap between them is the spacing based on the t-bolts right so all of that the slats were already screwed on the table and secured to come up with the measurement for my drawing right that's how I came up with the number for 34.6875 from one side of one slat to the other end of the other slat. You know what I mean? The seven slats. That's my overall width. And that overall width is based on the spacing that was between each slat uh, because of the T-bolt spacing and all that. So at this point in time, I don't have any holes in here. I don't have any uh, you know, place to put a fence. I don't have the layout of where my holes are going to be because your table may vary, you know, uh, you know, slightly or some. So it all started with the spacing of the slats. And so John and Debbie know, but then again, yes. No, really for the first initial setup, you know, you can use these files if you're 2440 owners, of course. But yes, when you're replacing uh one of the slats you can use your fences if that makes sense um debbie says guess you wouldn't be able to do that unless you made extra slats to start with as they wouldn't have the holes in the fence yet so there you go so debbie it clicked in uh on that and she's like oh wait a minute hold on that's making sense now uh michael says uh the new one has five yep the new one has five, uh, Michael, so you would actually add in that extra hole for that fifth one. Uh, you would draw that in and you know you would measure it. Uh, so basically on the very step one, step one is laying the board out and laying out the center of each of the T slots so that you can make your marks where you're drilling. If you have an extra T-slot in the middle because the new 2019 models have that fifth T-slot in the middle, you add that in there, right? Right, there we go. So it all starts from the beginning, which is awesome. So yes, and if your table doesn't have T-slots, maybe your maybe your table is like a Shapoko or an X-Carve that has a MDF table already. Well, if I already have an MDF table and I'd like to put a wasteboard and I'd like to use this, how would I lay it out? Because I don't really have T-tracks. 
you're just basically going to lay them out on your table and your spacing is going to be based on the quarter 20 bolts uh, which would be get to it you know your spacing is basically going to be in the quarter 20 bolts and you're going to be screwing these down to you know maybe some fixed inserts in your 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 mdf table or your uh you're going to screw them down however you're going to secure them down i wouldn't screw them down because that would make no sense i would put in brass inserts so that those inserts are always in place but you know everybody's table is going to be different this this waste board may work for your setup it may not I just want to make sure that you have somewhat of an understanding on how it's laid out and how you carve it. Um, uh, Tom Strickler says, how deep is the countersink for the machine screws? Well, uh, Tom is asking uh, the question, how deep is the countersink for the machine screws? And and I said here, I did a couple of tests and everything. So that first test, the bottom of this countersink right here where my mouse is pointing, if you guys and girls can see the mouse, uh, that is uh, about three eighths of an inch deep. Uh, I'm probably at about 0.3 here. Uh, when my screw is completely screwed down in my T-slot, I have a good to the top from the top of my board to the bottom here I have a good 3 16 inch to a quarter of an inch to the top of the screw so the bottom I would probably say is probably about 0.28 something like that and again I did test to see you know what I want Peter Hearn says, Laney, you might want to explain how to find the high and low spot on the waste board, G code to, uh, the G code to use. Um, well, basically, uh, on, let me get to the waste board here. Okay. So when I have my waste board on my table, you know, and I've got it here, you know, no, no surfacing or anything's been done. I'm going to take and I'm going to touch off on the four corners of my waste board. Okay. I'm going to come down here to the X, Y, zero area, X zero, uh, you know, Y positive, you know, I'm sorry, let's say that again. Y, X negative area over here, uh, X negative, Y positive here, X positive, Y negative, X positive, Y positive. I'm going to touch off on the four spots. And I'm going to bring the first spot, I'm going to set zero. And then I'm going to come and touch off on the other four and see which ones, if I'm higher or lower. And, uh, you know, is this corner higher or lower than this corner? Is this corner higher or lower than that corner? And I'm going to find the lowest corner of all four. And that's where I'm going to zero my machine out to. And then I'm going to create a pocket tool path with a zero cut depth and it's basically going to be milling that surface all the way to that cut. So if we were to look at waste board surfacing toolpath, let's turn off the toolpath here. I have a on my waste board area, my waste board area is uh, set to 37 inches by 22 and a quarter. That's my cut area, 37 inches by 22 and a quarter. And starting at the top of the surface and bottom left corner, but I have vector lines. And those vector lines are at a distance of 0.425, a third of my router bit. Okay, uh, a little, uh, let's see here, one, one, 
hold on a second. 1.375 divided by 3 equals. So a little uh, less than a third of my router bit. And so I have all of those vector lines spaced out and centered a third of my router bit so that when my one and three eighths inch diameter bit, 1.375, comes and cuts on that line, when it cuts, uh, moving from one line to the next, it's always overlapping by a third. Now, crucial, crucial, important, every one of these vector lines the starting point is the front of the table cutting back. We're basically, you know, running in that, that bit is rotating in a clockwise motion and we are conventional cutting going with that motion, you know, in that direction. So when this bit cuts, if we were to look at the toolpath, this on the x-axis here when this bit cuts it's going to come down it's going to cut raise up come back to the front of the table come down and cut raise up come back cut raise up come back it's only cutting in one direction not back and forth back and forth back and forth because then I'm Conventional cutting, climb cutting, conventional cutting, climb cutting, conventional cutting, climb cutting, and I do not want that. That leaves room for error. It leaves room for, uh, you know, it could cause unevenness in my wasteboard. Uh, I could get tear out if uh, for whatever reason. So I want to conventional cut, raise up. It's going to come back to the starting point of the next line. Raise up, come back to the starting point of the next line. Cut and raise up, you know, all the way through until it's done. So if we were to slow this thing down and preview this cut, you're not going to see anything because the cut depth, let me, uh, let me, let me exaggerate this cut a little bit. Give me a second to stop it. Little X down there at the bottom is how you stop a toolpath from running. Now I gotta let it catch up to itself. Okay, so let's exaggerate this cut a little bit. 0 0.03125. All right, so if I slow that down, That bit is going to come and surface, and let's speed it up just a little bit. It's going to come and surface a little bit more. And when it's done with that run, it's going to raise up. It's going to come back to the front of the table and start on the next line. It's all cutting in one direction. I want a conventional cut. I don't want to go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. I want to cut in one direction when I'm surfacing a waste board. I want to cut in one direction when I'm surfacing any board to prevent tear out and things like that. Um, and stuff, I don't know why I closed that. but So, uh, your let's stop this we don't need to so to lay it out you've got your cutting area you've got your vertical lines and I have my line spaced a third of my surfacing bit and all of them, the start points are all at the leading edge of the table 
conventional cutting with the rotation of the bit you know all right all right all right hopefully that makes sense for um peter hearn peter hearn all right now next question was do you find it to be a problem when you do double-sided project holes lining up in the larger holes in the wasteboard no john i don't that is a great question that is a great question let me get back to uh let's file close and uh new wasteboard jig john's question is, is hey do you find a problem and let me uh let me turn this off turn dimensions off and let me let's let's pretend that this is my table laid out here okay so john's question is and let me get rid of this uh oops don't do that hold on a second there are holes And get rid of this guy all right so let me draw in um, let me draw in my fences here for a second Hold your control key down, Lenny. Hold your control key down. Give me a second. I got to redraw my fences. Because these holes aren't right on that one. Uh, let's delete that. Copy to Pagao Layers. Copy to Pagao Layers. All right. Stand by. I got to lay this out correctly. you're going to have the corrected files and fences and everything uh, based on your spacing and all of that wonderful jazz and maroon. Um, Okay, so there's one fence. Two fences. All right, let me fix this one real quick. Oops. Oh, you son of a gun. go and this hole right here for my table isn't doesn't exist all right <clears throat> so I've got my fences on here now I'm gonna lay my project board out so let's let's say that I have a project board let's make this um, uh, let's put this on a new layer so it can be black uh, layer one we'll call it Move that to layer one. Okay. Now let's turn off the horizontal and vertical lines. And also the T-check hole done holes. Okay. So I've got a board here. And John, um, John's question is, is, do you find it hard 
uh, that uh, you know when you're doing a two-sided project that your holes land in one of the bigger holes no because I have the layout of my wasteboard right here and I can use this file new wasteboard as a template for myself with my project board and everything and it can tell me exactly where to place my holes so that when I am you know uh, flipping the board over uh, that it's not going to land in um, one of the big holes and stuff so I can drop a hole here and that one needs to move this one this guy needs to move drop a hole there and everything so that way when I flip this piece when I flip this piece know I'm in a position that I'm not near my holes now this one's a little close to that so what I would end up doing is I would move that one to a little bit more safer area maybe over here so that way when I let's flip it back you know here and here I'm in an opening and when I flip it vertically, you know, I'm still good. I'm not in a bigger hole. So I can lay it out, uh, you know, my hole positions and everything uh, so that I, you know, know where they may fall and stuff. And I can even take all of these, and let me delete that. I can even take all of this, John, and I can export this out. File export as a DXF. And I could call this my... Waste board layout, and I could in another project or whatever, let's say that I go uh, new V carve, and let's say I'm creating a file for a 12 inch by 12 inch board by three quarters, touching off on my waste board, bottom left corner. I could literally import my wasteboard layout and I work from the bottom left corner you know which would be let's get it into position you know and now I know where kind of my holes are laid out and it can tell me where to put my, my wasteboard holes. When I'm done with that, or my, my, my alignment holes, when I'm done with that, I can just delete that file out of my project, you know? So I always have a layout. So no, I never run into an issue where my holes fall into the bigger holes. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Michael says, how do you set that toolpath and Jeff says did you have to set the start point every line uh, Michael was your how do you set the toolpath was that regarding the waste board surfacing as well as Jeff's question um, and 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 Jeff no buddy Ro, uh, you zero out your bit Uh, 1.375 you zero out that bit on your XY zero and that bit will run the toolpath lines you know you'll create your toolpath and it'll it'll raise up turn on it'll run that first one raise up come back to the beginning run the second one raise up come back to the beginning run the third one you only zero out your X and Y one time and touch off your Z on the top of your board 
uh, and um, you run it one time, you do not reset. I don't think there's any job in, in its entirety that you would ever reset your start point every line. Uh, and as far as setting, ah, he's saying, do you have to set the start point for every line? That's a different thing. He's referring to, if I drew this line here, I thought he was saying reset the zero. Sorry, Jeff, that was on me. Uh, when I offset this, if I look at node editing, my start point is here, right? So that, with that being there, when I offset these lines, point four two five when I offset these lines all the way across my board keep going keep going keep going keep going all right now once I have them all offset I'm gonna take and I'm going to space this or center this on my waste board there we go center so it's nice and centered and every because that starting point was already on that first line it makes all of the starting points in the same direction okay all of the starting points are the same direction because the line was draw I drew the line and I put the starting point down at this end because I drew from left to right and then when I raid those out you know offset those outward and everything uh, it the, the starting point stayed on that same edge. There you go. Sorry, Jeff, I, I, I wanted to make sure. Um, uh, Colin says, seeing you are demo mode, are you not able to create tool pass and save it? Um, Colin, you're looking at my demo license up here. Uh, that is completely different than a trial version. Uh, demo means I am an instructor and I own the software for teaching and therefore demoing it. And no, this is a full version of the software. I can create tool pass. I can save them. Um, let's see here. This would be a point zero five with I'll just use it. Oh, that's not it. Hold on a second, I gotta find my uh hmm, I don't have it. I can calculate tool pass, bud, and I can save the tool pass uh, because I am a demo instructor. I am a teacher. Um, it is a full license as an individual or a business and everything like that. Um, and all that wonderful jazz. Great question. Okay, so let's see here. Um, Jeff says, uh, got to go. Looking forward to giving this a try. Thanks, Lenny. Thanks, guys. All right, so basically uh, what I wanted to just show you is the building process of the, uh, the slats uh, and everything. Um, making the waste board, you know, step by step. And then of course you would you would it would change for your machine or what have you. But if you have a 2440 or a mini carver, it's the same steps. Your other if you have a different CNC machine, same steps principle wise, but your you know how you you know how your slats run and all that will be different. And uh, so now that you've been able to see that, then we can um, the files. You're going to get, uh, so in the file package, basically, there's going to be a file for the two main fences. There's going to be a file for the cams and stops, the short stops and the cams. Um, there's going to be a file for the wasteboard, 
surfacing for 2440 and for mini carver users uh, you guys that don't have a uh, one of those if you have your own CNC a different one you will create your surfacing tool pass and all that uh, you know your own um, but all these files and whole layouts and everything you're gonna have everything and then you're just gonna have to adapt the file to your machine your needs 2440 and mini carver owners you do not okay it's already done for you okay all right any other questions ladies and gentlemen uh, let's see here we do have one William says last week I thought you said the slat width was four and seven eighths and this week it's four and three quarters just want to verify if correct slat width so the slat width is four and three quarters the slat width is four and three quarters uh, not four and seven eighths. I was incorrect when I verbally spoke that William last week. The slat width is four and three quarters, and of course your holes are uh, are drilled for your T-track holes at two and three eighths on the center of that slat. Uh, so four and seven eighths was a misspoke last week when I was mentioning this particular waste board, William Edlin. All right. So mini carver guys and girls, you'll have that. Everybody else will get the 2440, the larger one, and you will adapt those files. If you don't, if you have a uh, you know a different brand CNC, you'll adapt the files to um, uh, your needs and your machine. Now, I am going to make uh, these files uh, available in the description, uh, and they're going to be available for download for the first week of this video being up. After that, they will go into uh, my download store and there will be a fee uh, for downloading it. So anybody watching this video within you know, the first five days here uh, will get the files free and the tool pass and all that stuff along with a PDF step-by-step -step instruction. Uh, after that, there will be a fee for the download. All right. All right, ladies and gentlemen, if there's no other questions, I hope this little explanation did not confuse you. If you did, uh, I'm try I, I tried to create this video to um, maybe eliminate some of the confusion. But if it did uh, confuse you, you can always email me and ask the question and stuff. But I will do my best in a, uh, in a later video that is not going to be live. I will do my best to create one that uh, literally walks you through uh, the setup in an actual video of me out in the shop. I'll see if I can get that, but uh, the 4th of July week, I'm gonna be gone, so it'll have to be next week before I do that. All right, let's see here. We got one last question. Uh, what would a good speed rate for the surfacing bit be? Uh, when you're surfacing, you're only taking off a few thousandths of an inch. You wanna run that at a high speed uh, for uh, uh, my inch and three eighths bit, I'm running at around 70, 75 inches per minute, stepping over 33 and a third percent of that bit, uh, plunging about 10 inches per minute because it's not a plunging bit, you know, it's a surfacing. Uh, and um, I'm running my RPMs around 16,000 RPMs uh, on my router, which is for you guys and girls that have a router, uh, it's like between the three and four on the dial. You know, so I really hope to see some of these waste boards out there and stuff uh, and everything. Uh, these files, I'm going to clean up my mess here uh, for the next uh, hour. Uh, and these files will be available. Uh, digital Woodcarver owners, the files are going to be in the Digital Woodcarver owners group. Everybody else, the download link will be in the description of the video. And that download link will only be there for a week uh, from today, the first uh, after that, it'll be uh, you'll be able to find these files uh, in um, my download page, and I'll show you where that is: uh, digitalwoodcarver.com download page. But um, uh, for purchase, all right. Uh, yeah, Tim, it'll, it's great for the 2440. It's great for all scenes. It's just a nice wasteboard. It's versatile, mechanical clamping. And let's get out of let's get out of the Vetric software as I say my goodbyes to you. Um, it's great for mechanical clamping, whether you have these little edge hold downs or, 
you know, uh, rocker hold downs or we use wooden hold downs and stuff. Um, it's great for when you're using the fences and cams, uh, you know, uh, for cam clamping. Uh, there's other mechanical clamps that can fit into the T-Tracks. And then, of course, uh, like I said, vacuum clamping, you know, if you use vacuum pods. There's all kinds of versatility in there. A double-sided tape, hot glue, all that wonderful stuff. Because after all, it's still a waste board, right? Even though it's a jig as well. So a lot of opportunity there. A lot of versatility. And for me that I only have four T-Tracks on my table, this expands. Now I have... Um, if I have nine slats, one between each one, let's see here, one, two, four, six, eight. It gives me four or five uh, slots now on my table. Jeez, I gotta look at it now, hold on a second here. Uh, it gives me one, two, three, four, five, six basic T slots now on my table uh, that I can you know, slide anywhere and they're close together, four and three quarter inches. They're close together, so I can slide clamps anywhere. I can use wedge clamping, mechanical clamping, vacuum clamping, cam clamping, all kinds of things. And then something uh, down the road, ladies and gentlemen, something down the road that I will share with you and talk about, but it's a little bit more involved, and it really doesn't it really doesn't apply to anyone that does not use the Planet CNC TNG software, but you may have noticed that I have two uh, quick set blocks here. Um, this quick set block on this lower corner here is permanently secured and screwed to that corner. It never moves. And the other quick set block is a floating quick set block. And if we were to look at the bottom, it actually is connected to a board that has two pegs so that when I press it down in it always lands in that corner never varies right my X Y zero uh, what this does is I have a fixed home position by uh, you know touching off in this corner which means I can program into my TNG software that after I set my home, I can send my machine over and it'll automatically touch off on my touch block here for the Z0. And I have soft limits. Even with no limit switches, my machine will only go so far before it stops because it limits out. Uh, and one of these days, I'm going to talk to you digital woodcarver owners about that in TNG, how to work with soft limits, how to work with a fixed sensor versus a movable sensor, and that's all advanced. It will not apply to everybody, but we will be talking about that in the future, in the very near future. All right. But um, no, Pat has a great question. Pat says, um, do I need VCAR Pro 9.5 to view these files? You need desktop pro or Aspire at least 9.5 to open them up uh, otherwise you won't be able to open them but for that case you will also see in the zip file DXF files if you have an older version and you're rot not keeping your software up to date and running an older version you still have DXF files that you can import into uh, your design into your software so even though you don't have 9.5 you don't need it you know, because there's going to be DXF files of these uh, as well in the zip folder. So, no, Pat, you don't need 9.5. But, highly recommend that you update your software one day to keep it up to date. Um, Michael Paris says, I need the address for your downloads and your download store. Going to have to miss the rest of what the bummer uh, got to go eat. Okay. Uh, yep, Michael Parrish, uh, that will be in the description of the video. Uh, that download link for that will be in the description of the video and uh, Peter thank you uh, and again there's gonna be files for mini carvers 2440s and then the 2440 files ladies and gentlemen that don't own digital wood carvers you will just adapt those files to your machine and your needs all right I appreciate each one of you hanging out with me tonight and going over this and whoop oh, hold on Jeff I missed your question Jeff let me go back up here uh, 
Tip, tippy Looter, yes, it'll be on the Digital Woodcarver Facebook page. But Jeff says, Laney, do you recommend surfacing in one direction even for large beds? I have the uh, 48 by 96. Uh, that would double the surface time, wouldn't it? Uh, Jeff, I don't care what size your machine is. I would highly recommend surfacing in one direction to prevent tear out. And uh, we're always conventional cutting with a surfacing cut. Conventional climb, uh, you know, there's a potential of me getting little ridges and stuff in the machine, or th you know, things like that. I always recommend, um, you know, cutting in one direction. And you're, you're, yes, you're when it's raising up and coming back, it's coming back at its rapid 200 and something inches per minute. You know, when it's rapidly moving back, uh, you know, it's uh, rapid speed back to, you know, the beginning and all. So, yes, you're sacrificing a little time, but that time is improving your quality. So, uh, for me, absolutely, I don't care what size machine it is. I always recommend cutting, surfacing in one direction. Okay, for the final time. All right, everybody. Until next time. See you soon. I want to thank you for joining us tonight on Spindle TV, your best source for CNC CAD CAM training videos. If you're watching Spindle TV on YouTube, be sure to hit that thumbs up button and subscribe. You can find out more information about our training and products by visiting us at www.digitalwoodcarver.com.